Good afternoon, and welcome to our multimodality imaging conference. I'm Mike Quinones, and today we're going to talk about the echocardiographic assessment of chamber morphology and left ventricular function. The outline of the talk today is going to uh, consist of first talking a little bit about some imaging tips. Uh, remember that echocardiography is a tomographic technique, so it's uh, very important that we get the right tomographic clips. Um, left ventricular chamber dimensions, how to assess that, how to assess volumes and ejection fraction of the left ventricle. Talk a little bit about three-dimensional techniques, uh, left ventricular strain, and then we're going to touch a little bit on regional wall motion function assessment and a little bit of uh, how to quantify the size of the left atrium and right atrium. Now, the right ventricle by itself is a very important topic, and that's going to be covered by Dr. Naga uh, on February 22nd of uh, the upcoming year. Uh, before proceeding any further, just to remind everybody that if you have any questions to, uh, to send to us, um, just simply text the BAKI to 37607 and then place your question or comment. A lot of what we're going to cover today is um, discussed in the guidelines uh, that was published in 2015, Recommendations for Cardiac Chamber Quantification. Uh, first also was Dr. Roberto Lang, but as you can see, there's a large group of uh, experts that participated in this important document. And most of the focus that we're going to have today is in the left ventricle, which is uh, pretty reasonable given that a good amount of indications for echocardiography are for the purpose of assessing left ventricular function. And shown here are the four common views that are used to look at the left ventricle, parasternal long axis and short axis, and the epical four and uh, two chamber view. Now we're going to start with showing this case. Um, and having each one of you kind of give an estimate of the ejection fraction in your mind. And I think if we were in a room where we could all raise our hands or do a little bit of uh, audience response uh, voting, uh, my suspicion is that many of you uh, would say that the ejection fraction is probably 50% or better. And uh, I might even join you on that, uh, on that vote. Now, this is the same patient, look at the EKG, it's identical EKG, don't just um, less than a minute later. And now, I think we would all be saying, no, that ejection fraction clearly is abnormal, it's depressed, uh, it is not 50%. Also notice that the left ventricle looks much bigger on this view than it does on this one. And this is an example of a very common problem that we have in echocardiography, which is the problem of foreshortening. Because as we said earlier, echo is a tomographic technique, and we basically look at slices of the heart. So if this is a left ventricle, and let's say we're coming from either a parasternal position or the, epi or the epical positions, and we are cre creating a tomographic cut of that ventricle, we want to cut the chamber right through the center. But if we are a little bit on the side, what's going to happen then is that the heart will look smaller and the walls will appear to contract more vigorously with a smaller cavity that would give the impression of a normal ejection fraction. Whereas when the plane is more at the center of the cavity, the cavity will be bigger and of course, then we would see uh, the real depression of function that this particular patient has. Another type of foreshortening occurs in the apical views. Ideally, you would like to place the transducer right at the apex of the left ventricle and cut right through it. However, quite commonly, particularly when you are doing portable studies um, you feel the apical impulse of the patient, and if you place the transducer at the apical impulse, mo very commonly you're doing a tangential cut, and the ventricle looks smaller, and this here would be a pseudo-apex, not a true apex. 
The apical impulse that we all feel in a patient is not the apex of the LV. If in fact, it's kind of the distal border of the RV. So when you press a transducer there, you tend to get this tangential cut. How do you know it? Because when you turn to the two-chamber view, the apex would be to the side. It won't be pointing up. So, and the, the two-chamber view will show you a much longer ventricle than the four-chamber. So what you want to do is to place the transducer further down towards the mid-axillary line um, so that you can get to the true apex. And when that happens, then this, ap this apex in the two-chamber view will turn up and will appear um, will appear closer to the point of the transducer. Finally, another problem that can be a, a real problem, actually, is when you have a lot of translation. Patient is breathing very hard, or there is a pericardial effusion, or after cardiac surgery. The heart actually moves from diastole to systole. So in diastole, you may be perfectly uh, positioned, but by the time you get to systole, now you're foreshortening. And this one is a tougher one to fix. Um, but at least one should be aware of it. And the best view that makes us aware of this problem is the short axis. Because in the short axis, you see it very nicely that the circle of the, of the cavity of the ventricle is moving out of the plane, and that you are actually foreshortening by the time you get to end systole. So these are a few of the uh, suggestions or tips that are given in, in that uh, guidelines article. Um, is to minimize translational motion as much as you can, have a quiet, suspended respiration with the patient. If they can actually hold their breath for a few seconds at an expiration, that's very helpful. Maximize image resolution by putting all the settings in your transducer uh, properly done uh, using harmonics, which we do quite often, adjusting frame rates and g gains and dynamic range and all of those things. Avoid the apical foreshortening by having a steep lateral decubitus position and cutting the mattress so that you are able to bring that transducer further down towards the mid-axillary line. Now, that is very easy to do in the echo lab. can be more challenging if you're doing a portable uh, in an ICU, for example. Maximize endocardial borders, and this is where the use of contrast can be very helpful. And of course, identify diastole and systole properly. Very importantly, before you start making any measurements, uh, we recommend that you look at multiple images and select the image that has the least foreshortening and the best uh, technical um, qualities for then do measurements in that image. Um, many of the common digital systems now have a preview option where you can look at multiple clips together, and that accelerates the process of reviewing the views and then selecting the ones that you think are most properly done to make your measurements. So this is a preview of a patient and how big is this ventricle? Well, I guess we should even ask the question, uh, is there anything there that we can measure? You know, we, there's a heart, uh, it's beating, uh, maybe there's a valve here, but it's not until the lights are turned on that we actually start seeing uh, a lot of information. And of course, this is a beautiful example of the power of contrast in um, outlining the cavity of the LV. And when contrast was given to this patient, we can see that both chambers are contracting very well, RV, LV. The left ventricle is actually hyperdynamic. And it has some element of cavity obliteration and apical trapping right here. So, I mean, this is an image that allows us to stop the image at any time, trace it, get volumes and ejection fraction, um, and obtain a lot of clinical information that would have been almost impossible to do prior to the use of contrast. So contrast truly has been of great value uh, for quantification of left ventricular size and function. Now, the measurements of the LV are still used every day. Uh, they are still very practical and give us a lot of information. 
Ideally, you would like to make them from an end mode because the end mode has an outstanding temporal and axial resolution. However, the problem is what we see down here, that when you put a transducer in the parasternal position, quite often the long axis of the LV is tilted somewhat so that a dimension of the left ventricle that you want is one that is perpendicular to this long axis of the LV. Where, as you can see here, the end mode beam is coming in a tangential format. So very often, the dimensions obtained by end mode are not the true dimensions of the LV, and they tend to be over estimating the size of the left ventricle. And the greater this problem is, which in some patients can be quite significant uh, if you have to image them from a little bit of a lower parasternal window, then the more this overestimation of LV dimensions become uh, maximized. For that reason, we recommend that unless you have the absolutely most perfect end mode that you can see, that we do the dimension from the 2D image because there you can actually very well decide where you are perpendicular to the long axis and then do your diastolic and systolic dimensions, which are usually done um, a about a centimeter or so below the tips of the mitral valve. Now, an exception, an exception to this sometimes can be when you have very large ventricles in cardiomyopathies where the ventricles expand further if you want to use your, if you want to get a maximal end diastolic dimension, sometimes we tend to go a little further to the middle because that's when that ventricle dilates even more um, due to this spherical shape that many of these cardiomyopathy ventricles have. Uh, there are normal values that you can relate to, and the importance of this slide is to make the point that number one, males tend to have bigger chambers than females, but also Look at the body surface area. And here in Texas, we have a lot of very big folks. And when you get into a body surface area of 2.2, 2.4, 2.5, you can have an end asteroid dimension as big as six. However, if the person is a small person, then a six would be significant enlargement. So always pay attention to the size of the patient. And of course, um, the distinction between women and, and men. These are very good type of figures to print and have in your lab where you can relate to them very easily. So let's talk a little bit about function now. And these are two examples that are the extremes, right? On your left, you have a perfectly normal left ventricle with a great ejection fraction. And on your right, you have a big cavity that everybody watching us in, the, uh, in this lecture would know that is a depressed ventricle. So in these extremes, there is a quick appreciation that does not take much effort to uh, make the correct assessment. And why is it that we can clearly see that this ventricle is depressed and this one is normal? So what our, our eyes are catching are relative changes of the cavity area, where here, obviously, that area is shortening a lot. Here is not. And also, um, you can be looking at dimensions across the ventricle, and your eye can be following the relative change of these dimensions, which again are excellent here and very poor here. The other thing that uh, we have learned to appreciate is the opening of the mitral valve. And when you have a dilated heart and that mitral valve opens poorly with a significant distance between its maximal opening and the septum compared to here, that's another finding that makes us um, suspect that the ejection fraction or the ventricular function is depressed. Uh, one caveat about using that opening of the mitral valve is with AI. If you have AI, aortic regurgitation, and a jet that is coming into the mitral valve, that will reduce the opening of the mitral valve even, even if the ventricle has a normal ejection fraction. Now, this is a little bit more tricky type of example. Uh, this is not a big heart. It's a normal size heart. However, uh, it looks like the ejection fraction is probably somewhat depressed. Uh, to my eyes, I would have estimated this somewhere in the low 40% range. Again, what we're doing with our eye is we're looking at cavity, sh cavity shortening fraction. And here in the short axis, this appears diminished. 
again, the shortening fraction of dimensions across. And in this case, we can also look at the descent of the base. The longitudinal function of contraction gets diminished as the EF drops. And again, this is a very poor descent of the base of the mitral annulus. However, I have shown this example in conferences where we have audience response systems uh, and multiple uh, people giving their estimate, and you can see what happens. Although the majority is in that 40 to 50 percent range, you have some in the 30s, some in the 20s, and even a few voters that voted for 60. So estimation of ejection fraction is tricky, and it really should be done um, by people with expertise. And that's why um, now that we have more quality techniques and contrast echo and everything else, uh, we strongly support measurements, measurements of volumes, ejection fraction. And the guidelines uh, by ASE recommend the use of the uh, method of multiple disk, which is a modification of Simpson's rule, where you trace the cavity of the LV. And if you do biplane, then you use both two chamber and four chamber. And then this using the long axis as a reference and using the longest long axis of the two so that if this is the longest one, then this two chamber is stretched to match this one. And then each of these disks have volume calculated individually using a very simple formula of this formula of a, of a little disk, which is a, a nice simple formula to do volumes. And then you take every single volume and you add them together. If you did that by hand, it might take us a whole day. But the computers can do this in seconds. So nowadays, with the use of computers, you can trace the cavity and get this information very nicely. Note that in this example, the two-chamber view, the apex is also pointing to the transducer. So these were very well acquired. And if you're going to do two uh, the biplane, you need to make sure that you have both four-chamber and two-chamber properly done. Uh, if not, you could have also errors. Also note the way this is being traced. And notice that as the tracing is made, it is excluding a lot of these trabeculations within the cavity. And we have learned that two ways. When we have learned that when we started using contrast, because the contrast expanded the whole cavity and showed us that the traditional tracing, if we were including all of these trabeculation, uh, were creating smaller chambers than in reality. And second, when we did some comparisons with uh, MRI, as I will show you later. Now, there is um, an alternative method whenever you have uh, qualities that are not the best. It's called the bullet formula. The bullet formula can be used if you have a ventricle that has no significant regional wall motion abnormalities, so if you have normal contraction or if you have global hypokinesis but you don't have regional abnormalities, then you can use the long axis in an apical view and a short axis at the level of the papillary muscles in diastole and systole, and a very simple formula which treats the chamber of the LV as a bullet. And uh, the formula for volume of that bullet is 5 over 6 times the area in the short axis multiplied by this long axis. One thing that we recommend is to do internal controls. And if you don't have significant mitral regurg, then the 2D stroke volume should be similar to the LV outflow stroke volume. And that can give you an internal control to let you know that you are from, you know, within an accurate uh, range. For example, if you have a stroke volume by 2D of 75 and by Doppler 71, that'd be fine. You know, up to about 5 cc's of difference would be okay. But if you have, let's say, stroke volume by 2D of 75 and by Doppler only 55 and there's no mitral regurg, there's a problem. One of the two have a problem and then you have to resolve that uh, before you make a report. And this slide shows the value of contrast. Once again, contrast echocardiography is not only good to open, to open the ventricle and let us look at a, at a, at a left ventricle when you have uh, suboptimal qualities 
like the case I first showed you, but also very helpful for quantitation. So this is a heart that even without contrast, we can see that it is depressed. But notice how much bigger it looks and um, how much worse the EF looks when the contrast was given. And this is exactly what was found in this uh, uh, study done by Thompson uh, years ago in the Mayo Clinic, where they used EBCT as a gold standard. And when contrast was given, not only was there a good correlation between the two techniques, but the values were aligned close to the line of identity. Without contrast, there was a correlation, but notice that echocardiography consistently gave lower values than CT. So for an endosteric volume of 150 by echo, it was 250 by CT. Um, so contrast not only improved the relation, but also brought the values much closer to the values obtained with the CT. And this has been seen also now with CMR. And these are normal values, which are important to have. And again, uh, in our lab, we have these things pasted in the wall so we can quickly relate to them. Again, th this is what the normal for males and females, and then mildly abnormal, moderate or severely abnormal for the endastoid dimension uh, and the LV volumes. Now we have 3D. And the first type of 3D we had uh, several years ago was one where we had to average several bits. So in this case, we have four bits that have been stitched together. And then once you have that image playing, uh, you could do some very simple alignments to reduce the foreshortening problem. And then you ended up with something like this. And the, the system automatically provided the end volume of 158, the end-systole volume of 63, stroke volume, and ejection fraction. And when it's done well, it can be uh, an outstanding way of quantifying volumes and, and, um, and ejection fraction. The problem that we still have to this day is that the technique really requires very good quality images and also that they have not been able to solve the problem of working with contrast. So if you give contrast, you get, you get this beautiful contrast uh, enhanced cavity. The 3D algorithm uh, doesn't function well. Now, this was a very important paper done years ago, multi-center, so it was several centers uh, comparing 3D with CMR. And you can see very nice correlations, but still a tendency for lower values by echo compared to CMR in terms of the end diastolic volume. So a 200 cc ventricle by echo was about a 300 cc ventricle by CMR. And this is for ejection fraction, although there was overall a very good correlation, there were still outliers. So once in a while, this, you have these weird situations where you have some ventricles, like in this case, with the F of 50% or so by CMR, but 30% by, by 3D and, and so on. So the problem when you're using 3D is then, how do you know that your result is accurate or not? Now, today, we have moved forward and the computer algorithms, they have been improved dramatically. So now you can get one single bit volume and EF, and that really has improved a lot. In fact, you can get now left ventricle, left atrium, RV. So you can get several chambers now that can be assessed by 3D and on a bit by bit. So for example, in this example, endastory volume of 189, uh, EF of 48%. And this technique, when validated against CMR, has a very nice correlation in, in several studies, tighter than the one I showed you before for uh, averaging several bits. And this is for the addition fraction in this, in this particular study published in 2011. And because you can get single bits, you can look at volume curves. You can look at the uh, rate of uh, changes, uh, the apical contraction and the effect of arrhythmias. This is somebody with uh, atrial fibrillation, and you can see the influence of the R to R interval. So being able to do one single bit had really been uh, a significant improvement um, in terms of quantification. And we'll come to this uh, with some comments uh, a little later, but I want to switch now to the assessment of left ventricular hypertrophy because that's also a very important uh, part of our assessment of uh, ventricular morphology, and, and function. We know that hypertrophy has a negative impact on clinical 
prognosis and outcome, particularly concentric hypertrophy. Eccentric hypertrophy may even be a normal um, adaptation, for example, to exercise. So many athletes will have eccentric hypertrophy. People with chronic aortic regurgitation can go many years with the AI having eccentric hypertrophy and doing well. In contrast, people with hypertension, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or people with uh, aortic stenosis who have significant concentric hypertrophy, um, they tend to have a much worse prognosis, a lot more uh, cardiovascular events, heart failure, and so on. So hypertrophy, we know, is not always a good thing. And how do we assess it? Well, the assessment of hypertrophy is not through wall thickness, but through LV mass. And of course, ideally, you want to measure LV mass by 2D echo. And this is probably the gold standard or the best method right now of doing LV mass by 2D. However, it requires highly good quality images and uh, a little bit more computer processing. It uses tracing of the short axis in the, uh, in the outside border and the endocardial border to get um, an average wall thickness. And then from the apical views, some measurements of long axis and minor dimensions, and a very long equation, which of course computers can do very quickly. Uh, it would take you quite a while by hand. The, pro the problem is that on a clinical setting, you might be able to apply this to maybe 50% at best of your clinical population due to the level of quality that you need in the images. So for that reason, and since we do want to provide uh, an assessment of LV mass on a more routine basis, um, the guidelines document still recommend the very, very, very old uh, cube equation. Um, we started in the days of Enmut, but now can be applied also to measurements by 2D. So basically, you measure at end diastole, the end diastole dimension, and the wall thickness of septum and posterior wall. Beware of a sigmoid septum. If you have a sigmoid septum, then move further down when you make that wall thickness measurement. Because remember, the equation is assuming that the thickness of the septum will get averaged, and it will, it will be all over the ventricle. So let's say you have a one centimeter here and a 0.8 here, you're going to have an average of 0.9. That 0.9 is going to then be assumed to be this, this thickness all across that ventricle. So if you have an area that is asymmetric, that can affect the entire assumption, okay? So the equation basically is taking the diastolic dimension plus the septal and posterior wall and cubing them then subtracting the cube of just the diastolic dimension, and then multiplying by some factors that came out of a very old regression equation where they correlated uh, LV mass at autopsy with the LV mass obtained uh, in an echodon prior to uh, the patient dying. So it's a very old technique. Uh, it, was, it was done with Enmode. But nowadays, the same equation has been uh, passed on with the measurements obtained with 2D echo. Now, there are four types of uh, geometric changes in the LV that we should be familiar one, with the normal geometry, uh, concentric hypertrophy, which basically means high mass and a high ratio of cavity to wall thickness. So, it's called regional wall thickness, relative wall thickness ratio. Okay, so if that ratio is greater than 0.42, then there is a concentric remodeling. So if you have normal LV mass, but the ratio is increased, then you have concentric remodeling, which means you have a little bit more wall thickness than you should for that cavity size, but the mass is not increased. It's like a precursor of hypertrophy. And there's some studies suggesting that these people might have a little bit increase in cardiovascular events, although that is not 100% cons confirmed. If you have increased mass and also a relative wall thickness ratio greater than 0.42, you have concentric hypertrophy. If you have increased LV mass, but the ratio is normal under 0.42, then you have eccentric hypertrophy, which are the bigger hearts that have hypertrophy 
but with a normal relative wall thickness. And of course, normal geometry would be normal wall thickness, uh, relative wall thickness, and normal LB mass. And then we have values that are, that are published and you can have in your labs that you can use, again, for men and women in terms of uh, what the normal LB mass is and so on. So now we have the newer kit in the block, although it's not so new anymore. It's been around now for a, a good, uh, almost a decade now, of uh, speckle tracking imaging or strain imaging. And this has been possible because of the fact that ECHO today is a digital technique. So if you remember, when you do digital imaging, and that includes your own digital TV at home, um, the images are coming out of pixels. So there are little, tiny, little pixels in the screen. And that pixel contains a number. And that number can be changed into a brightness or a color depending on the processing you're doing of your software. In addition, you can now, with the, with the computers, track the movement of that pixel through time. So if this is a little pixel here at end diastole, and at end systole, it moved from this position to this position, you can track that. And I can track this other one that moved from this position to this position. And now I can measure the distance between the two in diastole and between those two, the same two, in systole after they moved. And look at the percent shortening of that distance. And that's what strain is. So strain is the relative percent shortening between two points which can be aligned in different ways. So what I'm showing you here is longitudinal strain because it's along the long axis of the cavity. So changing length divided by the initial length or fractional changing length is strain. If you in put in the time interval, then it becomes strain rate. Strain rate has been less used nowadays because it's still noisy and, and it just Technically, it has not been um, that easy to do, and additionally, it doesn't appear to yet has done much more in terms of clinical use than simple strain. Now, these two dots are aligned that we're looking here are along the longitudinal axis. However, we can look at different vectors. So we can look at two points that are moving along the wall thickness or thickening of the cavity, and thus it's what we would call radial strain, because it's coming towards the uh, center point of the cavity. And it's, in fact, it's kind of a measurement of segmental myocardial thickening. Circumferential strain are two points moving along the circumference of the heart in a short axis view, and then longitudinal strain, as we mentioned, uh, in the apical views. All of them can be obtained nowadays. Machines will do every single one of these. From the point of view of clinical use, more applications have been found with longitudinal strain than with the others. So at this point in time, from a routine clinical use, we are reporting longitudinal strain and using it and applying it more in the clinical arena than the other two. So this is a nice example of a normal. Uh, here we can see the circumferential and also longitudinal. And these are curves from the longitudinal strain in different segments. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six segments. And therefore, we should have six curves here. And this is an interesting way of looking at this. Um, this is time in this axis. And along this axis is basically the whole circumference or perimeter of this cavity. And what we can see basically that there is a homogeneous contraction and relaxation with the peak values being all pretty much aligned at the same time, which you see very nicely with this. So to be honest, this has minimal application. It's more of a visual um, format. So this is normal. And all of this can be placed in a bullseye and you can see now bullseye patterns and have the average value. So this is average peak global longitudinal strain, which would be the same thing 
as going back here and averaging all of these peak values, but in all of the segments. In, so that usually is done by doing a four-chamber view, a two-chamber view, and an apical long axis view. So when you do all those three views, you can create then this bullseye, and then you can obtain the average peak global longitudinal strain. In this case, it's a minus 21%. Now notice this cardiomyopathy heart with a depressed ejection fraction. Even though it appears to be a global dysfunction, you can see that there is heterogeneity. So this shows you very quickly that not all segments have same values at the same time. And the curves show you that very nicely. So you have some curves that are going all the way down to minus 12 where you have others that are about minus three, and then you have some that are actually akinetic or dyskinetic. They're going the opposite way. So, so whether you use this format or you use the curves, you can appreciate very quickly that there is heterogeneity of contraction. And then, of course, if you average all of this, the average peak GLS in this patient would be a 6.2%. So what's normal? So that's been interesting because uh, at the beginning, uh, a lot of people spend time trying to de define normality. And one of the issues is that not all the machines give you exactly the same values. Um, there is variation between brand X, brand Y, brand A, brand B. So after putting all this together, doing a large sample sizes, um, and doing meta-analysis of all the publications, uh, they have come out with these recommendations, okay? Anything over 17% is normal. Anything under 16% is reduced or abnormal. And then between 16 and 17, we and many others have chosen to use the term low normal. And that really is more to have a handle on sensitivity versus specificity. Because what happens is that, that at the beginning, a lot of people were saying 18%, but then you were creating a lot of disease where maybe it was not present. So in trying to get this balance between sensitivity and specificity, uh, these recommendations have, have come up. And again, this is for the average global peak GLS. All right. Now, not a... This is a measurement of systolic function, and like many other systolic function parameters, GLS is influenced by preload directly and by afterload inversely. So many experts have suggested that we should know the blood pressure of a patient when we report GLS because there may be variations from one day to another. If a patient comes in one day with a 180 systolic and another time comes in with a 120 systolic. So uh, afterload does play an in a negative effect on GLAs, and preload has a more of a direct effect. Now, this is a nice example of uh, the divergence or disparity between ejection fraction and GLS. This is a patient with cavity obliteration. So ejection fraction is uh, 90%. Uh, it's a hypertensive with severe concentric LVH, and yet, Look at the strain curves, four chamber, two chamber, and three chamber. A lot of heterogeneity, which you can see on the bullseye, because it, these, are, these softer colors mean lower values. So there is heterogeneity of contraction, and the average, of course, is reduced to 14.2. So this is one of the observations that was done earlier, is that in the presence of normal ejection fraction, some patients can have depressed GLS. And this was a, a study done by Potter in 2018 where they did a big review and put some large sample sizes. And here we have ejection fraction over 53%, borderline 45 to 53, between 35 and 45 and below 35, showing all the ranges that they were observing of GLS. So in this normal EF range, some patients had great normal GLS, but some were on the lowest side. Importantly, when you start getting into this 40% range and whatnot, high 30s, low 40s, the heterogeneity of GLS is a lot more. And why is this important? The reason why this is important is because more and more clinical studies are coming out showing that the lower the GLS, 
the worst clinical outcome. And that's where the importance comes in. So one of the uses of uh, this technique is to detect subclinical LV dysfunction in patients whose ejection fraction appear to be normal, uh, but are people who clinically have hypertension, HEM, diabetes, uh, actually transplant patients, chemotherapy toxicity is a big topic where uh, strain has been very helpful. Babula lesions now are, are being looked at. What was the, you know, somebody has aortic stenosis, asymptomatic, but the strain is reduced. Is that patient in trouble? Well, studies are showing that those people have higher rate of needs for, sooner need for bar replacement and development of symptoms, sepsis, and of course, HFPEF is a very important point. This list is growing. There's a lot of interest in looking at strain. And this is one very important paper that look at five-year all-cause mortality. 4,000 plus patients with heart failure. Roughly half and half between HFPEF and HFREF. So this is the probability of death based on ejection fraction. Not a lot, and we've known that for years. That ejection fractions, when you put, if you if you only look at half ref versus normal people, then ejection fraction is a very powerful prognostic implicator. But when you mix half pef and half ref, both groups have such a bad outcome, many of them, that ejection fraction loses its power. And yet, look at the power of peak average GLS. Very powerful. The lower the value, the greater the probability of death goes way up as you have lower and lower values. And it appears to start crossing somewhere around that magic 16. Remember that we, we said about 16 to 17, maybe borderline? Well, looks what happens when you start going below 16. Every start starts going up. So it looks like that 16 might not be a bad number to, to keep. You know, so I think there's more studies suggesting that the 16 uh, is probably a, a good crossover between normality and abnormality. And you can see how that curve takes off in mortality, probability of death, once these values start going down. And this is a mix of patients with good EF or, or bad EF. So quant uh, summarizing some of what we have said to, uh, so far, when quantifying, the first step is to select the optimal clip for best measurements. I could not overemphasize more the importance of that. Practice makes perfect. If you don't ever do it, when you want to do it, it's not going to look good. You have to practice. You have to get yourself familiar with the techniques. 3D volumes and EF are becoming more automated and accurate, and they're great. However, 3D needs good image quality and still doesn't work well with contrast. And there's still the challenge of resolving a disagreement, a disagreement between your visual estimate and the 3D. And, and this is where you may then have to do your own mat quantification by tracing yourself the, the ventricle, do something else. If, if you don't feel comfortable that the 3D values and your estimation uh, are relatively close, you need to do more work. Because you don't want to report a 3D value that may be totally erroneous. Uh, for strain, uh, detection of subclinical dysfunction uh, is a very important application. Um, no question that the worse the strain, there is more out, uh, bad outcomes in many diseases. Strain pro uh, provides an objective assessment of uh, global and, as you'll see, regional function. And there are many regional patterns that can be seen in myocardial diseases without uh, coronary disease itself. However, um, Remember, it's influenced by loading conditions. Inaccurate results can happen, particularly if the image quality is not very good. And uh, uh, just like 3D, how do you know if an abnormal result comes out in an individual where everything else looks normal? Do you accept it or you don't? And that's, again, where you need to put so, some expertise in deciding whether you're going to accept that value, let's say a, a strain of 12, when everything else that you see in that left ventricle, ejection fraction, wall thickness, left atrial size, everything looks okay, but you're getting a strain of 12. Do you report that as a reduced strain or do you just don't report it because you're concerned? That's when you have to look at the whole image, how the strain was done, is it tracking properly, and so on.
And then there are clinical limitations that we still are wrestling with. How do we treat an asymptomatic patient with a normal EF and abnormal strain? Do, do we do something differently? Uh, how do we manage patients with valvular diseases who have reduced strain? Do we intervene sooner? Um, we need a lot of prospective studies. So we have a tool that is phenomenal. It's giving us information that the eye doesn't provide. But we still have to struggle with where is the best application of the technique and how do we use it in making day-to-day -day clinical decisions. Now, a little bit about regional function. Here we have um, an interesting, uh, very well done 2D echo. Again, notice that in both apical views, uh, the apex is right pointing towards the transducer. There's global dysfunction with low EF, but also there is uh, akinesis of this inferior base and then global hypokinesis of all the other views. Likewise, this uh, inferolateral wall is akinetic. So it looks like there's some RCA trouble plus some global issues that could be due to multivessel disease or whatnot. This is another case. So this one has a low EF. This one has an EF of 54%, but the apex is abnormal, which takes us to the assessment of regional uh, function by the subjective evaluation of wall motion. And really, subjective is uh, underlined three times. I cannot teach you that here today because you will learn that just by reading many, many echoes. Now, we're going to have another session in stress echo, and we might do a little bit more um, on that, and I'll show you more examples on how we do that. But assessment of wall motion um, by the eye is really uh, an art, and it takes the, the uh, combining the wall thickening that you see with the actual movement of the endocardium, and also understanding that different segments behave a little differently. For example, the inferior base tends to be, and the inferior septum in a four-chamber view tends to be a little more hypo compared to other segments in a normal in normal people. So you have to kind of appreciate that the base of the lateral wall in four-chamber tends to be a little bit more mobile than other segments. So you kind of learn about the normal heterogeneity that exists, um, uh, and then. Once you feel comfortable, and I, I would say our fellows, after uh, one or two months in the lab, they, they, they do a pretty decent job with, with uh, wall motion. So I think it's something that is not that difficult to appreciate and learn. Um, so then you define that uh, your wall motion in terms of normal, hypokinetic, akinetic, dyskinetic. And today we're using a 17 segmentation uh, model where the ventricle is divided in 17 segments because the tip of the apex now becomes a segment by itself. So we have six segments in the two chamber, uh, six segments in the four chamber plus the apex, and, and then in the long axis we have likewise uh, six seg segments. So all together that gives us 17 because some of the segments are shared by more than one view. If you then take a number to your wall motion, one for normal, two for hypo, three for achy, four for dyski, five for aneurysmal, you sum all those segments, divide by 17, gives you the wall motion score index. So normal is one. Uh, a 2.0 is pretty abnormal because it means that there is a lot, you know, half of the ventricle having abnormalities of wall motion. And it has been shown that the wall motion score index just by itself um, has some prognostic implications when you follow people over, over years. So this is that case that had that inferior uh, wall echinesis, and this is the strain. See how the strain picks up very nicely. In fact, it picks even more worsening contractions than, than the eye picked up. And you can see that there's a large area here of RCA and CERC that are affected, and then you have some areas here, probably in the LAD territory, that are still relatively okay. Now, the average, of course, is pretty bad, minus 10. But you can see that there's a fair amount of regionality with some segments really being super bad compared to others. This is the case that had that apical hip hypokinesis, and you very nicely can see that the average is 12.5, but there are segments here that are perfectly normal, 21%, 24%, and the apex is very densely affected. So the bullseye can be very, very helpful in uh, helping you 
sort of check your eye and see how well there is a relation between the strain bullseye and your own assessment by eye. Um, I'm just saying this because uh, we'll talk about this during stress echo, but it's being challenging to do this technique with exercise, and I'll leave it at that for now. And this is a well-known pattern that uh, has been shown very nicely in many conferences, the apical sparing, where the apex contracts much better than the rest of the heart in patients with uh, cardiac amyloidosis. And this is an interesting one also where you have everything is perfect and you have this very small, dense area of very bad strain. Uh, in this example where by 2D alone, you don't really see much, but this makes you suspect something called apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in fact, when contrast was given, bingo, you see this area of hypertrophy and trapping of the apex with akinesis of the distal apex, again, also seen very nicely by CMR. So the strain, in this case, this was a true story, alerted us to the presence of probably apical hypertrophic myopathy for which reason contrast was given, diagnosis was made. Later on, an MRI was done to do further investigation of severity of disease and markers for prognosis. So in summary, regional strain may help in the detection of regional abnormalities in CAD and also in selected uh, cardiomyopathies like amyloid, sarcoid, apical ACM. But regional abnormalities are also seen in patients with reduced peak average GLS, for example, just hypertensive patients with uh, LVH or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy as the one case I showed you where there was a lot of re um, heterogeneity of uh, strain uh, contraction. Finally, a little bit about other chambers. Uh, left atrium won't take us long because the gold standard today of left atrial size is no longer the anteroposterior dimension of the LA in a parasternal view, but the assessment of LA volumes by tracing the end systolic LA size, which is when the LA is at its maximal volume, and doing that in a four-chamber and two-chamber view. And there are two methods, and both are uh, accepted by the guidelines, and also both provide very similar results. One is the area length, which is a very simple equation, and the other one is the multiple, multiple desummation, just like the ventricle. And you get actually very similar results with both. And again, after putting a lot of large sample sizes of patients together, normality is defined now as 22 plus or minus 6. So if you use two standard deviations to create the normal range, that takes us to about 34 cc's per meter square, corrected for BSA. So whenever you are left HL volume is beyond 34 mLs, per uh, meter square, we talk about uh, an enlarged left atrium. And these are tables for males and females talking about normal, mild, moderate, or severely abnormal in terms of volume corrected for body surface area. So again, up to 34, 35 to 41 would be mild, moderate, 42 to 48, and beyond 48 severe, uh, with women being relatively similar. So here you don't have to have a dramatic uh, Remember, uh, having to remember male and female too much because they tend to, to be relatively similar. The same for the RA. Now, the RA, there's not a biplane technique. So for the RA to me, is right now obtaining a very good quality um, four-chamber view that enhances RV and RA, and then tracing the cavity at, at end systole, again, when the RA is at its maximal volume, and uh, getting a simple area length measurement of uh, volume with not the Values being not too different for um, an enlarged RA, if you use two standard deviations, roughly is 34 for women, but 39 for men. So here you do have to remember a little bit that there's a difference between both genders and uh, take a look at the patient and decide which one to use, if it's a man or a woman. So for a man, uh, a 37, for example, would still be normal, but that same value for a woman would be uh, dilated uh, RA. And again, you can put these things in your lab to have them for, for uh, reference. So in summary, accurate quantification uh, starts with excellent image acquisition. First step is to select the optimal clip 
for best measurements. So evaluate all your, quickly take a look at all your clips. And, and if you have a preview type of uh, approach that uh, simplifies the process, and then select the ones that you think uh, have the optimal uh, tomographic plane for that particular measurement. Consider using contrast to enhance, enhance your borders and reduce the chances for, for shortening. 3D techniques and strain imaging are both progressing very rapidly. They're providing accurate values when image quality is good. And expertise is needed to ensure that you have this quality, uh, accuracy and reproducibility with these techniques. And perhaps the most important point to take home is be careful about reporting measurements that you have serious concern regarding accuracy. For example, you have a, a man with a body surface area of 2.5, and you have an end asteroid dimension of 3.8. That's impossible. That's impossible. That is wrong. And in fact, quite often, you take that patient and you give them contrast and expand the cavity by contrast, and that 3.8 becomes now a 5. So, you know, look at the size of the patient, look at the whole overall clinical situation and the images, and if you don't feel comfortable with reporting a value, uh, don't report it. Because remember, people who read your report are going to take that information as being gospel and trust them and apply them in clinical decisions. So I thank you for your attention, and um, we have a few minutes for questions. If some have come in, um, trying to look for, uh, you can help me if you see any. All right. So I don't see any questions at this point in time. Uh, we are a couple of minutes from 1 o'clock, so I thank every one of you for your attention, and uh, tune in next Tuesday as we continue this series of conferences in multimodality imaging.